Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome. My name is Richard Ball. I've been asked to make a very brief introduction. I'd say we're really, really few brief words at the outset. Um, before I introduce John. Um, first of all, just a note, um, he's going to turn your phones off. Both of mine are almost certainly turned off. Um, the event will run until 2 o'clock, sharp, and then we're, we're finished. Um, the initial address is obviously on the record, but thereafter, thereafter the challenge has the role of apply. And all responses will be off the record. People can use the information, of course, but they can't actually. Okay, my name is Richard Brown. I'm, I'm a random wandering civil servant from the Department of Communications Office to deal with internet policy issues and a few minor cybersecurity bits and pieces as well. Um, by way of introduction, I'll just point out that the, um, the internet has, has changed a lot of things, obviously, um, in more than a few ways. One of the more confounding and, and um, challenging and compelling implications is internet security. Um, in many ways, it's really changed the social contract. We've all come to it to understand what the state's role in regard to security. Historically, we could always assume that the state had a border. The state owned the border. It owned the borders to our maritime space, to our airspace, and to our land borders. Right now, because of the way the large technology companies and the internet has permeated borders, institutions, companies, and infrastructure, that same reality doesn't hold in cybersecurity. As a professional job, or probably a few people say it, but the internet has become a spatial. And in that kind of situation, we're now more heavily reliant on companies than we ever have been before, which takes us neatly to John's role in all of this. Microsoft, obviously, at the very core of the internet, and its very foundation, and although some would argue that they happened despite their best efforts. Um, John is the <coughs> Vice President for EU Government Affairs and leads the Microsoft Brussels office. Um, Previously, uh, Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Digital Trust and Security, which includes law enforcement and national security for Microsoft. So, he has an extremely broad understanding <coughs> and history in the space. He also, obviously, is here today to speak about their Microsoft's ongoing work in developing a, a new global framework for cybersecurity. Presumably, to an extent, we'll talk also about, we'll hear about how states should react on, uh, on the internet, which I look forward to doing. So, I can't make any comments about it in this course. And, uh, Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I, I'm going to try to talk about, um, I guess, this is not meant to be a particular policy discussion, right? This is just a broader awareness uh, about some of these topics because I do think that. This is a 20-year issue. In fact, I think it's a permanent issue that we're going to have with us um, as long as we have the internet. Um, our offices in Brussels are right next to the European Parliament, and just on the other side of the Parliament is the European House, which is a museum of European history that just opened last year. Um, there's a room with a single object in it uh, on display. It's a pistol no bigger than my hand. Uh, it's the Browning pistol that was used to assassinate Archduke Ferdinand uh, in June 28, 1914. And of course that was the start, uh, or at least the spark for World War I, which ultimately <coughs> left 21 million people dead. Now, the lesson of World War I is that I think our industrial capacity to produce weapons that could kill exceeded our statecraft and diplomatic capacity to manage warfare. I don't think anybody who got into it had any idea of the magnitude of, of the losses that would be created uh, and the destruction. But today we face issues in cybersecurity where our capacity is not yet developed to deal with threats that are all too real. And, and so uh, on June 27, 2017, uh, in the Ukraine, a small piece of code was launched that propagated quickly throughout Ukrainian businesses. It was done through the update software to a software pro program called MEDOC, which was essentially everybody keeps for VAT compliance and compliance. So it's on 
virtually every business is computer. And um, code was spread, and within hours, virtually every federal agency in the Ukrainian government was ground to a halt. Hospitals, the banking system, um, and businesses. And this was, we later find out, launched by the Russian military. Um, and just, if I can digress for a second, just when we, you know, when, we, when we talk about these things in retrospect, we can sort of precisely say what happened. But, you know, people talk about the fog of war. Well, in cyber war, the fog is even greater. Because nobody knows why it's happening. They just know my computer's got this weird message that is reformatting my hard drive. Um, and suddenly everybody in the building has the same message on their computer saying their hard drive's being reformatted. And, and so for us, when these things happen, we've, we've got a new center response center, we can pull together engineers, and we're constantly, you know, we want to get our hands on one of these computers uh, from the local people, you know, the local team will go out and get, get, you know, so we can observe the code, but if you've got a, a malware that is causing the hard drive to encrypt, you don't know what the code was executing, and so you have a harder time just figuring out what's going on. And then for us, the question is always, would a fully patched machine that, you know, be vulnerable to this? And for, there's vulnerabilities in software, we call zero days, that is, those are vulnerabilities in software that have not been, they're not known to us. And so, even if we knew about it, we, you know, we there's no patch for it. And so, when there's an attack using a zero day, uh, computers are especially vulnerable. In this case, um, it was not a zero day. The, I, the potential exploit had been disclosed to us, um, and there was a patch, so fully patched machines uh, were protected. Um, so we also realized in the Ukraine we don't have a means to provide customer support simultaneously to the whole country. You know, it's a special problem. Um, you've got, you know, everybody, you can't use their computer, you know, so you can't push out information that way. Um, and these hard drives are encrypted, and he's trying, he's trying to figure out what to do about it. I think there's a lesson both for governments and for us. Um, at the lunch discussion, there were some very good points about you know, we, governments and private sector will be collaborating more and more on this. Um, you know, from the government perspective, we call them citizens. From the corporate perspective, we call them customers. And when customers have a problem, they call us. Um, and, and so we're all in this. <coughs> the not hedged attack didn't just stop the Ukrainian border, though. <coughs> and whether this was intended to impact every Western business that dared to do business in the Ukraine, or it was accidental, it spread around the world. Uh, there were several major corporations that announced or disclosed that they had issues. It would be pretty hard to hide for most of them. Maersk, the world's largest shipping company, um, operates 74 ports around the world and um, a 20% of the shipping fleet of the world. Um, and their operations ground to a halt for about two weeks. And, and so the ports, the port of Los Angeles, um, a large part of goods got stuck uh, and couldn't be moved. Now, there was other companies, FedEx, um, Merrick, the pharmaceutical company, Saint-Gobain, the French um, construction company, building, building supply materials. Um, uh, so there's, there's a large, the large spillover effect. The total cumulative cost of this attack, probably about $10 billion. Um, and it was about six, it was more like, Eight months later, uh, the United States led a group of governments to announce an attribution of this to the Russian military. Um, and so they did that just before the Munich Security Conference last February. 
Um, interestingly, um, no country, though, called this a violation of international law. There is consensus that international law applies to cyberspace, but what rules apply and how do you apply them? Um, we, we gathered a group of, of legal experts, and apologies for repeating the story here, but um, that day before the new security conference in uh, Munich, and we got 12 international law groups there, uh, and we asked to look at the facts as best we could tell from the, from the Montpetit attack and the WannaCry attack that happened the month before that most notably took down the UK National Health Service. Um, and the lawyers discussed, debated, took a vote. Not catch an attack, they said that would be a violation of international humanitarian law because it indiscriminately was launched and affected civilians. It wasn't just targeted. They'd just done the federal government, maybe. But um, it was indiscriminate against civilians and it was destructive. Uh, it, you know, you may have gotten the message that if you pay some money, you can get your data back, but you weren't getting it back. Um, and so, uh, but on the, on the WannaCry attack, the group split 50-50 because there was a sense, an argument, that you aren't in a situation of armed conflict with North Korea. And, and so when they launch a cyber attack, is it, you know, does international humanitarian law apply below the threshold of armed conflict? And in a sense, there's this gap or soft space in international law that exists. Now, the, the Red Cross, um, they take a position called the first bullet doctrine. So the first bullet fired laws of humanitarian laws apply. And you already worry about the first rock. Um, something else, but, <clears throat> but as a practical matter, the way international law works, it's done by customary application. And again, the International Red Cross may say it's a violation of international law, but they don't do that. Um, but countries have. So we've got this sort of system that is, allows for great destruction of civilian property, and we don't have adequate protection. Now, we called for two years ago, we called the Digital Geneva Convention as a means to deal with this. We set out saying the convention should do, we've got three pillars to our, our, our plan. We need binding norms for government behavior. They need to be binding, not just the like-minded countries will follow. Because right now the situation is we can kind of get consensus among Western Europe, North America countries, but if adversaries don't adopt those, recognize those rules, you know, what's the point? But so we get started. So we ultimately think we need binding rules. We also need to increase attribution. Um, we need governments to call out other governments when they do this. Up until now, it's sort of been this world of intelligence where there might be a news story or somebody sort of a reporter's got a source saying that somebody believes something and kind of pointing people in the right direction on. But if we're going to change behavior, we do need to name and shame and we need to build up customary international law. Um, we've learned a significant amount about our capacity and the private sector capacity to assist with that identification of who's behind an attack. Um, we get um, several billion data points a day from all the devices in the world. We've got a pretty good sense of when things happen. Now, governments have other means, signals intelligence and other human intelligence, and, and they get it, you know, they have access to information we don't have. We think that together, our information is, can be very useful to helping governments more accurately or more robustly attribute attacks. Um, we've also, we have one in the process though that 
nation states take attribution as a, a statecraft, not a scientific term. And we have learned that we will talk about attribution, but we're not going to talk about, or we're going to talk about accountability, but not attribution. We're also, we want to have an, a new non governmental organization. Um, and I expect that in the next three months we'll announce one that, that has funding, broad funding, that will be a private sector organization to work on cybersecurity resilience and can provide assistance to countries who are under attack and can be a means of private sector coordination so that we can perhaps work not just on our individual products, but on the collective ecosystem of the internet and the corporate networks that we operate in. Um, so we have taken steps by gathering some industry groups. There's a group called the Tech Accord, Global Tech Accord, which is now signed up about 60 companies. Siemens has something roughly analogous called the um, Charter of Trust, where private sector companies are trying to do more collectively to enhance our security and really resilience. I mean, the old model was if you build a big wall around your computer, you keep people from getting in. Now we realize that's not going to work. And so you have to assume that people are going to get in. How do you, you know, how do you think through that scenario and and minimize damage and maximize your ability to rebound? So resilience is the key concept that we're going to be working on uh, with other companies. Um, the Charter Trust Company does take some points of view about we're not going to we're not going to do offense um, against you know, private sector, right? Now, at Microsoft, we've committed that we're not doing offense for anybody against anybody. Right? We're, we're not breaking into anybody's um, stuff at all. Um, but other companies do work for militaries that do legitimate work in this space that have been ethically you know, considered. Things. And so, but the chart, but it, you know, the tech board group of companies is important. The, the international process is kind of broken, just to be honest. Um, the UN has been the forum, and they've had um, a group of governmental experts appointed for a few sessions, um, and they did make some good progress. And so the basic affirmation that's, that international law applies to cyberspace was there was consensus reached in NASA in 2015. And there are some norms that are being developed there, and that's good. Uh, in 2017, um, the group was unable to reach consensus. And there were a lot of things going on, but some governments were essentially blocking it. And we do have some very, if you will, hot disputes at the moment that are just, uh, let's be practical about it. I mean, with Russian interference in Western elections um, is a significant complication in how you talk about cybersecurity in international forum. And last month, um, the new General Assembly adopted two resolutions. One appointing a new group of governmental experts with a very limited mandate. And then the second appointing, adopting the Russian resolution, which will have an ongoing working group in a different part of the UN. You know, and our, our going back to the private sector, we're the ones who own and operate the internet, we operate the corporate networks. Um, it is our developed technology that's operating not just in the private sector, but in the public sector and largely in the military as well. And so we have a stake and we want to see at the table. So we had some discussions last summer about what can we do. And um, President Macron was convening the Paris uh, Peace Forum uh, in connection
connection with the centenaire of the armistice, and that was last November 11th, just three weeks ago. Um, and so um, I was given the assignment of going into the LSA and pitching the Macron administration on a joint declaration that we made by governments and by private sector and civil society on the importance of cybersecurity. And so um, it eventually became the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. You'll each have a copy at the end. Um, but it's important because it did it brings together previously agreed commitments and puts them in one place. It's also important and, and, and kind of strengthen that way. It's also important because it is multi-stakeholder. Um, when launched, we had 52 governments that had signed, about 200 corporations, 100 civil society groups. Um, you know, we feel very good. Each of the EU 28 in the end signed. Um, and so there is opportunity consensus in Europe to advance this. Um, the, um, the question is where do we go from now? There's some sense that it's easy to define norms, easy to write rules. People shouldn't do that. Um, you know, and, and you know, as Moses, you know, found in the Ten Commandments, you can make <coughs> you can make rules, getting people to follow them is a harder thing. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't make rules. But but right now, in the international community, the discussion we want to have is how do you have rules that people will abide by? And we think that is increasing, we depend upon accountability, attribution, and development of um, um, uh, greater means to hold people accountable. But in a sense, we all know who's doing these things. Right? We know it was Russia that, that produced the WANA cry, or excuse me, the Nantechi attack. We know it was North Korea that did WANA cry. Um, we need to actually have real discussions, frankly, with the Russians about some of these issues. There's a disagreement saying, well, they want to control content that goes into Russia on the internet. That's the issue they care about, and we don't want to go there. We're in a standoff situation, though, and I think dialogue is essential, or we're, we're not going to make progress on it. Um, you know, the, the Russians have, they're not trying to be subtle here. Um, and, and I think we need to figure out how to, to work with Russia. The Chinese have significant capabilities we need to work with. Um, and we're going to need to figure out a broader system. Um, to support not only this, we, we've also help support a broad-based campaign. We have 100,000 signatures now on Digital Peace Now. We've also got a copy of the end of the presentation. Um, but it's, it is trying to reach out, especially through young people and, and through some civil society groups, um, to, uh, to raise the idea that you know, digital citizens want digital peace. And we do need to devote time and attention, and I know Government's agendas have lots of important priorities on it, and our pitch is this should be one of them as well. <coughs> so with that, I think we'll we'll turn to the discussion and take comments and questions. Absolutely.